Mm -hmm. And okay, so we're recording. So Alison, thank you very much. Sure. And then when we finish, I'll send it to you and you can just verify that it worked out the way we wanted it to. That sounds good. Are you going to have it so you two are talking next to each other the whole time? Are we talking? Yeah, I think I think I will do that. I decided okay. to do that. Yeah, I think that's okay. easier. Well, have a good conversation. Look okay, thank to you. you. Bye. Now the other funny thing, Maria, I, I've learned I, I um, put my notes here, but no one else sees them. Like you can't see them, right? Right. Okay, good. All right. So you ready to go? Ready. Good. Okay, here we go. We're joined now about, <clears throat> I'll start over again. And oh, the same thing. If, if we really mess up like a whole question, then we could just do that question over again. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. <clears throat> We're joined now by Maria Madison, one of the co-presidents of the Robbins House in Concord and an Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the Heller School at Brandeis University. Maria was also the inaugural recipient of the Concord Museum's Robert Gross Award for the Advancement of Concord History. Maria, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I want to focus this evening on a fascinating story with Concord Roots Ellen Garrison grew up in town and is known as having integrated Concord's bicentennial parade in 1835 with her friend, Abba Prescott. Ellen was African-American and Abba was white. This feat as a 13-year-old may have been a harbinger of an even more courageous act to come. We hear a lot about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1968, but less about the Civil Rights Act of 1866, passed in the wake of the Civil War who affirmed that all citizens, regardless of race, were equally protected under the law. Some 90 years before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery, Alabama bus, Ellen Garrison Jackson tested the law in an interesting case in Maryland. But before we get there, Maria, can you just briefly tell us and explain when and why Ellen left Concord? Absolutely, I love that question. and uh, Thank you so much, Tom. You know, maybe Ellen left for the same reason all of our kids leave to go to college. It may be as simple as that. But in Ellen's case, since she was African-American, born in Concord in 1823, um, maybe it's a little more complex because she wanted to join the African-American community in Boston. In particular, you know, though she was born in the Robbins house at the corner of Concord, uh, and lived there until 1840, she first left Concord to move to Boston, likely because of her family and for political ties. Um, Boston at that time was the center of African-American uh, community and abolitionism and movements. And um, she also had ties to the first African Baptist church on the North Slope of Beacon Hill. It turns out that uh, that church in particular was founded by her uncle, Obed, and likely her mother, uh, who also helped to found that uh, church. So though both were deceased before she moved there, her sister was also living there by 1840, which is when she moved there. So while she, there, while she was there, she participated and likely led a variety of abolitionist campaigns, signing petitions on behalf of not just African-Americans, but also on the rights of indigenous populations. Um, most likely when I read the work of uh, birthright citizens, um, in that text, I think it describes that African-Americans were worried about the fate that they would experience would parallel the fate of the Cherokee nation of indigenous populations and land rights. So they were signing petitions, not just on behalf of African-Americans, but also on behalf of others. And um, she worked to end racial segregation in schools and the railroads and hosting events for leading abolitionists. So she left Concord both to follow family, but also to follow her political leanings as well, possibly infused by ideas uh, that were thriving in Concord at that time. And then why does she leave Boston and Massachusetts? Yeah, so she leaves Boston, Massachusetts, because she's genuinely at that time beginning to hear the call 
of the end of the Civil War. She's hearing the call from uh, the beginning of the Reconstruction Era. In fact, before the end of the Civil War, 1863, she writes a letter to the American Missionary Association saying that she feels it's her duty, the duty of African Americans, to help each other, to help Blacks who are newly freed uh, slaves, newly freed and newly emancipated, to help each other. For if we don't help ourselves, she writes in one of her 100 letters during the Reconstruction era, if we don't help ourselves, who will help us? Uh, and so she determines to set out to become a Freedmen's Bureau teacher uh, within the American Missionary Association in the Reconstruction era. So she does so determined to help other Africans and um, descendants in the diaspora. That's great. So now set the stage for us. It's 1866, just a year mm -hmm. after the Civil War ends and months after the nation's first Civil Rights Act is passed. So Ellen and another female teacher were using a ladies room at a train depot in Port Deposit, Maryland. What exactly happened there? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I constantly reflect on that year in particular. And I think it must have been a momentous year for Blacks in particular, Black mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. um, people like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper are speaking and, and creating organizations for suffragist movements. Black women, you know, moving to try and get citizenship mm -hmm. uh, and creating organizations like the American Equal Rights Association. So there Ellen is as a Freedmen's Bureau teacher beginning to teach the newly freed enslaved people during Reconstruction. And I think she was actually the second black woman to join that effort within the Freedmen's Bureau. Hmm. So she's there uh, in 1866, trying to teach the newly freed people in Port Deposit, Maryland, along with another school teacher, Mary Anderson, in Port Deposit, Maryland. Um, one month after the country has passed this civil rights bill, which you mentioned in April of 1866. One month later, Ellen and her fellow American Missionary Association teacher, Mary Anderson, purposely take seats in the ladies waiting room reserved for whites only at the Baltimore train station. And according to one of her 100 beautifully written letters, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed that she was sitting there because one month previously, her house, had, or more recently, her house had been burned by vandals. Hmm. We don't know much more about it than that, as she states so specifically. And she needed to go to replace some of her belongings. And to do so, she needed to take a train. So she goes to the Baltimore train station, and she's sitting there, and there are two events that occur. The first day that she and Mary Anderson are sitting there, she is uh, visited by or confronted by a white woman who tells them that they uh, couldn't sit there in the whites only waiting room in the Baltimore train station. And um, the next day, she, they try to do the same thing. They're determined to sit there again. Mm -hmm. And only this time they're confronted by a station master mm -hmm. who's impersonating a police officer. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine being Ellen and Mary, they're not just testing this new law two times in two days, right. but they're literally thinking, we know this individual is impersonating a police officer. Hmm. So they, take, they stand their ground, if you will, because they are aware of this first Civil Rights Act passed one month right. before. Right. And this station master forcibly ejects her from her seat. And we know this because she writes it eloquently in one of her letters. She writes it, they're forcibly ejected, physically assaulted by this station master, telling them that they had to leave the whites only waiting room. And she writes of the event in her beautiful handwriting, we were injured in our persons as well as in our feelings for it is with no gentle hand that we were assisted from that room. And she quote, and I quote, I feel the effects of it still. So with the help of the black community who raised funds for a legal case, and she writes this in a letter to his, her direct supervisor, General Stannard, who works within the Freedmen's Bureau, um, she writes, 
uh, that we are going to raise a legal test to this because we are aware of the 1866 Civil Rights Act. So Ellen files uh, a lawsuit in the Maryland District Court under the Civil Rights Act of 1866, only one month after it had been passed by Congress to test whether civilized people had rights that ought to be protected. So the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was one of several measures for racial equality pushed by our own Massachusetts, Charles Sumner during the Reconstruction Act or Re Reconstruction period. Right, right. It takes place right from 1866 to 1877. Mm. The years are you know, contested depending on which historian you read, but I believe Du Bois you know, brackets that time period of 1866 to 1877. But that act led to the 14th Amendment in 1866 and the next Civil Rights Act, which was in 1875, which was later overturned by the Supreme Court. So, and how does the story of Ellen and the station master end up? I, I know that you and your Colleagues have tried to do some digging into the court records. How did it get resolved? So problematic. If you read Ellen's letters, which are beautiful penmanship, right? I have to say penmanship that exceeds Henry David Thoreau's penmanship, <laughs> even though he was like a Harvard trained. Right, um, right. it's not too hard to do. But, uh. <laughs> right, uh, her penmanship is beautiful. And she writes eloquently that she believes that, you know, the individuals representing or the lawyers representing the station master, the Baltimore station master, mm -hmm. um, wanted her to settle out of court, right? Mm -hmm. And she determines to not settle out of court because she believes not only did this station master, master forcibly eject her, physically assault her, she describes, mm -hmm. to leave the white women's station room, station waiting room, right. but that he was impersonating a police officer. Mm -hmm. So she feels that it's a good and just cause that will bring her justice, and she wasn't willing to settle. Mm -hmm. We couldn't rest with that as the end of our story. Uh -huh. So we, within the Robbins house, became the grave diggers of history, if you will, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and went to the Maryland Historical Archives. Mm -hmm. um, we went actually also to the Library of Congress archives mm -hmm. and set out to find the answer, the outcome of this story. And we found the outcome within the Maryland State Archives and digging within those archives with our gloves on and, uh, you know, right. flipping the pages of original documentation found that the case was dismissed oh. without justification. It just says case dismissed. Right. Uh, and uh, we short on time, but what happened to Ellen uh, afterwards? How, how did she live the rest of her life? So we know the result of the reconstruction era is debated in how we describe that depending on which historians you read i would say that an honest reading of the end of the reconstruction era is that it was too successful that it demonstrated that of course these newly freed individuals had all the faculties that were you know allotted to them through their ancestry and the success of the african civilizations so that the um the outcome of that case also resembles the end of the Reconstruction era that I will say resonates with contemporary times. And to be blunt, there was a fear of a zero sum game in effect, mm -hmm. that the individuals of that time were worried that providing rights to blacks meant there would be fewer rights for whites, mm -hmm. providing financial and equity to blacks would reduce the power and the political structures and system, as well as the financial wealth of whites at the time would be reduced. Mm. But because of that, the Reconstruction era was defunded. Mm -hmm. The political progress and representation in Congress of blacks at the time was reduced. Mm. And so with that, Ellen also lost her job. Mm. With that, Ellen moved and married for a second time to Kansas, and we find her in the uh, post um, aftermath of the Exoduster movement in a dusty area of Kansas, where mm -hmm. she really and her husband were unable to convert dust to 
arable mm -hmm. land. Uh -huh, right. So they attempted that experiment for a while and then ended up moving to Southern California mm -hmm. uh, and Altadena, um, uh, Pasadena, mm -hmm. California. And we find Ellen, her husband, as well as her sister, uh, eking out the rest of their lives in Southern California, where ultimately she's buried in the cemetery that was actually founded by descendants of John Brown. Oh, so we're wow. still, yeah, we're still ah. investigating what the relationship may have been that resulted in her being buried in the cemetery uh, that was ultimately uh, huh. initiated through the descendants of John Brown's family. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, Maria Madison, uh, we're so proud of our partnership with uh, uh, Robin's House. We look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues. And we thank you for joining us this evening for all that you do to raise awareness of Concord's African, African-American and anti-slavery history. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all so much. And we're very, very excited about our partnership. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great. And now I have to do end. Oh, no, I do this here, I think. Stop.